All right, good morning. <clears throat> uh, today what we're going to do is we're going to practice another external rate of return problem. Uh, in past semesters, uh, it's been really clear that the external rate of return problems are uh, pretty complicated and it takes people a couple of times before they finally figure out how to apply the method. So I wanted to give you an additional bit of practice for that. Uh, just in case it might inform and help you with the homework that's due tomorrow by noon. So remember that uh, I extended the deadline for that so you've got a little bit of extra time, but <clears throat> you need to upload it to Blackboard before 12 o'clock tomorrow. Uh, the other part of the in-class exercise we're going to do besides an additional external rate of return problem is we're going to do an illustration of why you're not supposed to simply pick the project with the highest internal rate of return. You remember that's one of the warnings we talked about in class on Tuesday was you can use internal rate of return for initial screening, uh, giving a project a thumbs up or thumbs down in terms of its suitability, but you can't necessarily rely on the internal rate of return to identify the project that's the most profitable. So today's in-class exercise uh, illustrates why that's the case. Okay, so now just to uh, review this figure that was presented in class on Tuesday. Remember that um, what we're doing with the external rate of return is we'll have some cash flow diagram or it may be a cash flow table and all of the outflows we take to the present, all of the inflows we take to the future and the future in this case is the last year that there's any sort of an inflow. Now, if there is a year that has both an inflow and an outflow, you have to find the net amount in that year. So this is an important point. In this illustration, if I took the outflow to the present and the inflow to the future without finding the net difference between the two, so if I treated them separately rather than considering the difference, then that would give me uh, the wrong answer in the end. Now, when I'm moving the outflows to the present and the inflows to the future, I'm doing that at the external reinvestment rate. Who can remind us what the external reinvestment rate is? Is that the, the stuff that you make off your investment and you put it back in? It's it's one of two things, yeah. If you're not investing it back into the investment, you're investing it into other things. Okay, so external rate of return analysis means we can't put the profits that are generated back into the original project. And so these represent these up arrows represent our profits. So the question is what are you gonna do with them? after you receive those profits. If you can put them back into the original project, like with the savings account, then you're able to calculate the internal rate of return. If you're not able to reinvest them into the same project or a project that yields the same rate, then you have to calculate an external rate of return. And so there's some secondary account where you're putting all of your revenues and all of your profits and that secondary external account has some interest rate that is a given. And so you use the given interest rate to find out the present value of the outflows and the future value of the inflows. All right, so we've got this cash flow diagram. And then the last step that we're doing is we're taking these future values and we want to find out an unknown interest rate. What unknown interest rate is going to make these future values equal in magnitude to the present values that are, uh, that are outflows. So we discount it at some unknown interest rate, and that's the external rate of return. And we have to do that by iteration. All right, so I have the in-class exercise here. Let me hand it out, and I'm going to give you a moment to uh, set it up. My suggestion is use the same template format that you used uh, in class on Tuesday. So hopefully you saved that file and you can just create a copy with a different file name. I'll bring the template file up on the screen just in case you uh, 
didn't have that.
So we translate the cash flow diagram into a cash flow table. And the reason why we have a separate outflow and inflow column is just so that when there is a year that has both an outflow and an inflow, it's more obvious to us that we have to take the net difference between the two. Also, we're only taking the present value of the outflows and the future value of the inflows, so it also makes sense to have separate columns because of that. Uh, one thing that I saw a couple of people doing is just because the cash flow diagram says 13, that doesn't mean that you're taking all the amounts to year 13. The future value that all of the inflows should be uh, compounded to is the last year that anything happens in the project. And so the last year that you see an inflow is year 9. And so our table will go 0 through 9 and therefore year 9 is what's going to be 0 years until the future when we're doing the future value calculations. All right, so the sum of the present value of the outflows is 24,440. The sum of the future value of the inflows is 106,000. And so what we need to do now is just start with some guess value of the external rate of return. And what we're going to do is we're going to discount these future values. And so equals PV will take them to the present. We're going to discount it at this unknown interest rate that we're going to keep changing around. And if they're all in year 9, we need to take them 9 years to get it to year 0. So n equals 9. And it's not a recurring payment. It's just a single lump sum future value amount. So I'm skipping over the payment field. And I'm going to do the negative of this sum. So it doesn't change the sign. I have to manually do the negative. All right. So 1% is not high enough. 2% gets me closer. What I'm looking for is I'm looking for what interest rate will get this equal to the sum of the present values. So I keep manually iterating. And I can get there manually if I'm patient enough. Or I can do a goal seek analysis. Because I know that my objective is for this to be 24, 4, 0.67 by changing the external rate of return. And when I solve it, it should be 17.75%. Okay, and I saw several of you uh, also got that same 17.75%. Any questions about the method? You've been through the method twice now. You get another chance on the homework assignment that's due tomorrow by noon. So my hope is that when we have a quiz sometime, that if you were, at, if you were asked to solve an external rate of return problem, that then you'd be able to do it. That's what I'm hoping. All right. I see lots of knowing smiles. So I guess you've got my message, right? OK. Any questions about this method? Just to reiterate, why do we do this? The reason why we do this is that a lot of businesses can't put all the money back into the same business. You have to store your profits somewhere else. Have you ever watched a movie where drug dealers were burying their money like underground? Or they just have it like uh, stuck in a warehouse or something? What, the problem is what to do with all the money, right? Well, in our case, you can't always put it back into the same in original investment that generated the revenue. So you have to take into account what rate of return are you earning in that place where you put the profits to know your overall weighted average of the rate of return. That takes into account, that weighted average takes into account two things. It takes into account where you're putting your profits, and it also takes into account the rate at which profits were originally generated by the original project that this lump sum investment kicked off. And so it's a weighted average with the external reinvestment rate is a given and the external rate of return being the unknown. So don't lose track of the overall big picture. I mean, sometimes you can get a little bit um, complacent when you have a template 
and you figure you know where to plug the numbers into the template and that that's all you need to know but really it's important to also understand the big picture of what this is doing and when you would use it. External rate of return. Any questions before we move on? All right, be sure to save that file in case it might be useful for you in the future. Um, now, when we were talking about the internal rate of return on Tuesday, the warning that I gave you was don't use internal rate of return to pick which project is best. Only use internal rate of return for initial screening to know if a project is potentially suitable. Meaning, uh, you use the internal rate of return against the MAR, the minimum attractive rate of return. You compare those two to find out if a project will be profitable or unprofitable. Now, some definitions here. The project, if we have mutually exclusive alternatives, the one that we should select is the one that's going to maximize profits. Uh, now, later on in the semester, we're going to acknowledge the fact that maximizing profits really isn't the only objective. Like, if you could get maximum profits but totally uh, destroy a river, um, maybe that would give you second thoughts. Or if you could get maximum profits but you were you know, abusing workers or breaking the law or cutting corners in safety. You know, like there are other factors to consider. But let's say that you're honoring all the ethical obligations with two alternatives. And so now what you'd want to do in choosing between them is pick the one that gives you the most profit. That's the overall ground truth uh, decision factor. The illustration we're going to go through now is the fact that sometimes the project that has the highest internal rate of return doesn't yield the most profit. And that's counterintuitive because you'd think the one with the highest rate of return would also give you the most absolute profits. But remember that a rate of return is a relative measure. It's measuring the profits relative to the original investment. So if two projects have a different original investment amount, meaning that you know, to buy one investment is cheaper than the other one, then that can throw things off. And that's what uh, the in-class exercise is going to illustrate, is that you can't just compare projects by the internal rate of return. All right, so on the second page of your handout, I ask you to go through a consideration where what we're going to do is uh, we have project A and project B and they're both relatively straightforward. You have a lump sum investment and then you have a series of revenues over a 10 year period. They have the same time frame. The revenue, revenue amount is the same every year. So um, I'd like you to start off by in part A calculate the internal rate of return for each project and just because it's good practice don't use just the IRR function. Uh, calculate the internal rate of return the full way where what you're doing is you're going to be um, finding the present value of all these future amounts and the interest rate is going to be changing until there's equilibrium between the inflows and the outflows and so you know that was the the first part of the in-class exercise on Tuesday so you can check your answer using the IRR function but Let's take the time, and we have the time. Let's go through the trouble of using the, uh, the full method for part A. And then in part B, use the factor table that's provided here. I've given you the factor table, and find the present worth of each project at the MAR. At the minimum attractive rate of return of 4%, then find the present worth of each. And then C and D are kind of thought and short answer questions. And so I won't go into too much of that. I'll give you a, a chance to think it over and come up with a response for both of those. But let's start by using the uh, full manual way of calculating internal rate of return.
Okay, so if we calculate the internal rate of return for project A, we find it's 12.4%. What that means is the $50,000 we invent, invested, that $50,000 is earning a rate of return of 12.4%. Whereas if we go with project B, it costs more to make the original investment. Instead of 50,000, we have to do uh, 85,000 to get the project off the ground. And we're only earning 10.28% instead of 12.42%. So just by the initial looks of it, if you didn't know better, you'd maybe think that project A is better. You know, someone who didn't know the rules would say, well, Project A is better because it costs less and it has the higher in rate of return. And that's an attractive argument, but it's not right. And the proof that it's not right is if we find the present value of both projects. And so if we uh, take a look at the present worth of Project A, it's 22,998, whereas the present worth of Project B is 28,553. Now both of those are if we're discounting the future revenues at 4% at the MAR. So who thinks that they understand uh, how to reconcile the apparent discrepancy? The fact that, you know, on the one hand, someone would say, well, why not pick the one that has the highest internal rate of return? But then on the other hand, this is showing that project B is more profitable. Now how do we explain that apparent discrepancy? Anybody willing to give it a stab? Yes? The IRR only, only says that, or it only assumes that project A and B can be reinvested okay. um, continuously um, as to where if you take the present value of both options, you're just seeing which one's worth more now the values that you get from interest over time. Okay. All right. I think that's definitely part of it. You said some important things there. You remembered that the internal rate of return is uh, assuming reinvestment. And let's say in this case that that's a valid assumption. Let's say that both of these are investments that can take the revenues that are generated internal and they can be reinvested. Um, but still, it seems like there's a discrepancy. And the, the solution, the reason why Project B is better is that um, it's better to earn a slightly lower interest rate if you can invest more. Let's say, for example, that you can go to the bank and borrow money at 4%. But you're going to take the money that you borrowed from the bank and you're going to put it into a place that generates more than 4%. And that's what both of these are. These are a pair of investments where you're going to be generating more than the MAR. And let's say that the MAR represents your borrowing costs. So if you could go to Huntington Bank and you could borrow $50,000 at 4% and then get 12% return on that $50,000, that's one of your options. Or the other option is to borrow from Huntington Bank, borrow 85000 But if you borrow that much, you can't get quite the same rate of return. But the total amount that you've invested is larger. And so therefore, the net profits are higher with Project B. So the difference is, it's better to get a lot of an investment at a slightly lower rate of return than a smaller investment at a higher rate of return. Because the overall net profits are going to be greater even though we had a smaller rate of return for project B. Just the simple fact that you are able to put more into that investment means it's going to be more valuable. And so this illustration kind of shows why you can't use internal rate of return for choosing the best alternative, but you can use it for initial screening. And both of these pass the initial screening test. You know, are they acceptable if the MAR is 4%? Yes, both of them are acceptable. And the way that we know that is that both of them have a present worth that's greater than or equal to zero. Both of them have a positive present worth. And so now this question D, 
Who's willing to tell me what did you write on part D of the in-class exercise? Kayla, what did you write on part D? I didn't put anything, honestly. Oh, shame on you. I didn't know how to explain it. All right. Who wrote something? Nobody wants to talk. What did you write? Uh, the MAR represents the highest interest rate allowed, while the present worth represents how much all the values are worth today. Okay. Um, I think that's mostly right. Um, you said the MAR represents the highest interest rates that's allowed, and it's not necessarily the highest because our MAR could have been 5% and we still would have made a profit on both of these projects. So the MAR is uh, just the minimum rate of return that's acceptable for us. And let's say if we're borrowing the money at a certain interest rate, and that's like the lowest rate of return we can accept. Because you never want to have a rate of return on a project that's lower than what you pay to borrow the money. But what the present worth represents, like what is this um, $22,998? It's the present value of the profits. It's the present value of the future profits when you also take into account the purchase price of the investment. So if we go back to the cash flow table, you know, we had to pay 50,000 and then we got 9,000 over time. It's how much money is left over after covering the loan. If you borrowed this $50,000, remember the bank is going to want it back and they're going to want back interest. They're going to want back 4% interest. And so Every time you get $9,000, you keep some of it and you give the bank some of it. The part that you keep, if you took all of those future amounts that you get to keep and you discounted it to the present, then the present value of your share is $22,998. So does that make sense? That it's the present value of the profits and they're your profits, assuming that it was a loan and that you were paying back the bank their 4%. Okay, well, that's all I have for you today. Um, just that illustration that you can use the internal rate of return for initial screening, but not for absolute decision making. You need to look at maximizing the profits. That's the rule that will never uh, send you down the wrong path. If you do a present worth analysis and choose the option that has the highest present worth, then that's what you should choose is the best alternative. Remember that your assignment is due before 12 o'clock tomorrow, so please upload your files to uh, Blackboard by then, and I'll see you in class on Tuesday. Have a good day.